Okay, we are recording. All right. Uh, Good morning. Due to the governor's statewide disaster declaration relating to the COVID-19 pandemic and current public health guidelines for social distancing, I've determined that it is not prudent for the members of the Economic Development Commission or staff to convene in person for this morning's meeting. Therefore, the members of the EDC are attending this meeting by video conference. Those same conditions require barring access to the public for in-person attendance. In light of those limitations, the public is invited to attend and listen to the meeting through Zoom platform or by phone as indicated on the meeting agenda. To comply with the Open Meetings Act requirements for virtual meetings, this morning's meeting is being recorded. And uh, the next step is to take attendance. I'm going to call the rolls, uh, Pam. Yeah, uh, Mike Elias. I'm present. Uh, Jay Levin. Present. Mina Hall. Erwin Steinberg. Present. Roger, you're here. Present. And uh, okay. I'm Brown. Very good. All right, we got a bunch of uh, relatively short things on the agenda this morning. And uh, we've got uh, Dave and Jim Hogue here this morning to talk about uh, zoning procedures. And my thinking is, if you're all okay with this, that we kind of turn the agenda upside down and start with talking with Dave and Jim about uh, the zoning process in Long Grove. Uh, I think I know some of you know that there has been some interest expressed in the parcel just north of Sunset where the Bally Bunyan golf course or driving range is now uh, talking about, uh, they're talking about they'd like to get industrial zoning for this parcel, which is interesting. Uh, but to talk a little bit about that and more about what the process would be in terms of actually changing zoning in the, in the village. Uh, the thought was that Dave and uh, Jim might come in and give us a bit of a tutorial. Would that be okay, Dave and Jim? Yeah, yeah sure. Okay, so where do we start? Uh, you want me to go ahead and start, or Dave, or how do you want to work this? Go ahead, Jim. You're, you're... Okay. Um, first, a little background in zoning. Uh, the way the zoning is set up in the village, we use what's called a Euclidean type of zoning, which goes back to a case in the 1920s, uh, Euclid versus Ambler, which basically legitimized uh, the kind of zoning that we use. And the way that works is the zoning or the uh, community is divided into categories by land use. These are called zones. In the uh, village, we have residential districts, we have open space districts, we have business districts, and we have office research districts. Those are the limits of the categories of land use that we have. Um, zoning is related to the police powers, uh, the public health, safety, welfare, Etc. Um, so it, it, it serves a public purpose. Um, that's that's the essence of uh, a valid zoning ordinance. If 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 it doesn't meet those kind of things, if it's not performing a public purpose, then the zoning ordinance could be uh, potentially uh, struck down. You you run into the issue of a taking. Uh, those kinds of things. Um, the ordinance typically regulate height, bulk, use. Um, among other things, those are uh, uh, typical controls that you would find in a zoning district along with land uses that would be permitted. Um, this tends to get somewhat rigid, somewhat inflexible. So there are uh, basically two kinds of uses that you'll find in the zoning ordinance. There's uses that are called permitted as a matter of right. So uh, let's take residential, for example, to be very simple. Uh, we have single family residential land use categories. R1 has a three acre minimum lot size. If you wanna build a house, you get permits, you comply with the R1 district regulations, good to go because a single family residence would be allowed as a matter of right. If you wanna put a gas station 
location in an R1 zone property, well, that wouldn't work because that's a commercial use. A commercial use wouldn't be allowed in the residential district. Uh, and again, it gets to how the, the zones kind of break up the uses. Now, in addition to uses being allowed as a matter of right, there's what we call conditional uses. And those uses, um, I like to think of them as they could be a good use, they could be a bad use, but they require more scrutiny than uses that are allowed as a matter of right. So there's a process we go through. Um, there's a zoning process uh, called uh, a special use permit process that would allow uh, a special use to be considered, um, takes public hearing, public input, but the most important thing, again, is differentiated by a matter of right, conditions can be placed on a conditional use. So if there's an externality, like let's say lighting would be an issue, um, you could regulate the height of the light poles, you could mandate screening on the lights so that you don't get glare, uh, those kinds of things, and that could be a condition tied to that use. Um, if the use cannot be mitigated, uh, if conditions can't be placed on it to where it would be a good fit with the location, then the conditional use should probably be denied. So that allows for um, more flexibility uh, in the zoning code. Finally, there's variances that um, are allowed. Uh, a variance is based on hardship, and it really should be um, scrutinized that way. Um, if there's a defect or something with your property, like you live on a cliff and you can't meet a setback because you'd fall off the cliff, or a lot of times mature tree covers in the village uh, is something we look at because that's something that is uh, important to the character of the community. So if somebody has to you know, cut down 10 trees to put an addition on their house, uh, that may be a hardship because it affects the character of the community. So that may be something that would be a, a good basis for granting a variation. A variation is typically a uh, relaxation of an aspect of the zoning requirements, setbacks being a big one. Um, in our code, we um, are very limited in the amount of variations that you can ask for. We have what we consider authorized variations. And if it's not an authorized variation, then you can't seek relief from that requirement. Um, one of the things that's kind of unique to the village is we have a lot of planned unit developments. Um, that is another flexible zoning technique. Um, basically, it's allowed, it, 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 the ordinance that approves it functions as its own kind of separate mini zoning ordinance. So. From an administrative perspective, it gets a bit tricky because you have to look at a proposal or a house or whatever is being done from not only the approval perspective from the PUD, but also the underlying zoning district. So again, let's say the R1 district, uh, if it's an R1 PUD, the PUD's ordinance would take precedent over the zoning ordinance, but anything that's not covered in that PUD ordinance would default to the zoning code. Um, Briarcrest that you brought up, very interesting situation. Um, it carries with it what's called the R1 and R2 PUD district, which was a very, um, very interesting, interesting zoning, uh, interesting PUD. The flower farm is actually part, the Omens that's on 83 is actually part of the Briarcrest subdivision, and that was approved as part of the Briarcrest subdivision. Um, there's a clause in there that if that would go back to, if the flower farm would go away, it would go back to R1 residential zoning. So for anything to happen on the flower farm, you're going to essentially need to amend the Briarcrest PUD. Um, Valley Bunyan to the south is uh, again covered by a PUD, a planned unit development. Um, and that is for the golf driving range. Um, it does not carry a commercial zoning district with it. It, it carries the, uh, I believe it's the R1 PUD. Uh, it also has conservancy easements on it. Um, conservancies and scenic corridors are something that's, in my experience, unique to the village of Long Grove. Um, they're mandated through the subdivision ordinance, and along with zoning, subdivision and Zoning ordinances are two of the main tools, I think, that you have to promote community character. Um, while your comprehensive plan will set up an overall scheme for land uses in the village, the, the plan has no enforcement 
mechanism to it in and of itself. Um, you need the zoning ordinance for the most part. That's the big driver in, in implementing your comprehensive plan as well as the, um, the subdivision regulations. The conservancy uh, easements and the scenic corridor easements are mandated when a piece of property is subdivided. Scenic corridors provide a buffer along the uh, major roadways. Conservancy areas are more to protect um, environmentally sensitive soils. Uh, predominantly what we have in the community is what's called a lowland conservancy. These are typically wetland areas. Um, they provide not only habitat and, and add to the character of the community, but they're also very, very important for groundwater recharge. And as a lot of our residents uh, draw their potable water from aquifers, protecting the recharge areas is, is very important. Um, so again, with both Briarcrest, or with the flower farm and Valley Bunyan, um, there would need to be amendments to those PUDs for anything to move forward there. Um, again, they restrict anything other than what's there to a residential zoning district classification. Uh, I know that's a lot. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Did I thoroughly confuse you? Good morning. This is Dave. Yeah, Dave. Um, if, if I could, I just wanted to add one other layer just to um, uh, at least let everyone know the what these conservancy and scenic corridors um, and other uh, platted restrictions mean. Um, there can be other platted restrictions as well, but once something is platted, it's pretty much set in stone. Um, to amend a plat, um, not only does it require the village uh, village approval, um, it, it also requires that the property owners that um, have property rights basically through that plat to agree with the um, the change to the plat. So in the case of, of the Bailey Bunyan property, um, if the prospective developer comes in and wants to modify, amend the existing platted con conservancy or scenic corridor easements, um, not only would that require um, uh, the village board approval, but it would also require um, all property owners. Maybe not so difficult with that piece, assuming that you have a single owner, but it becomes much more difficult, particularly where we have these subdivisions that have um, what I would refer to as mixed uses. Um, so Fairfield subdivision, uh, which is the subdivision directly across from uh, Sunset Grove, and it's between Robert Parker Coffin and, and Old McHenry, that actually includes what is now the Harbor Chase and was formerly the Fairfield Savings and Loan. Um, that piece um, had platted setback or like building box um, for, the, uh, for the property. And one of the prospective developers prior to Harbor Chase that came forward um, needed to um, reduce those setbacks, the platted setbacks, and they weren't able to get 100% of the property owners to agree to it. Um, so they were never able to proceed with um, uh, that proposed development for the property. Um, there are other things that come into play in addition to the zoning that I believe probably everyone here already recognizes, but I just want to point them out. Um, and, and a lot of that has to do with access. Um, uh, access through the state and the county um, has become more challenging from a development standpoint um, as each really is focused on moving, tra moving traffic through the community, um, not so much on um, providing access to individual parcels. In terms of the um, Harbor Chase, what is now Harbor Chase, um, that came into play with the county um, as Old McHenry Road is a county road and the original development um, that was approved through Fairfield Subdivision uh, had a prospective traffic count 
um, based upon the approved uses. And the county issued, approved the plat, um, issued a permit based upon those traffic count numbers. Um, when there was the other um, proposed use for that property, uh, we went with the developers before the county asking for them to amend that access. And uh, their response was that they would not allow for increased traffic because they had concerns with the proximity of the um, access point on Old McHenry Road to Route 53. And um, uh, so the, the charge to the prospective developer was um, come up with a plan that did not exceed those numbers. Um, they weren't able to do that. And that was another hurdle that they uh, weren't able to get over. Um, but one of the comments that the county had at the time was um, they don't need, they wouldn't have to honor that existing entrance on Old McHenry Road because they did have safety concerns with it. Um, since that parcel has um, direct access off of Route 83, even though it's a right in, right out, um, it also has somewhat of a circuitous access through uh, Robert Parker Coffin if you go through the medical office building. They viewed that property as having access regardless of uh, uh, whether or not they had an access point on Old McHenry Road, and therefore they didn't have to grant it if they didn't want to. Um, I believe that when you get to um, the Bailey Bunyan property, there are some um, agreements, I believe, that in the, the subdivision approvals that allows for um, I, I, one or two of those parcels to be potentially access the main drive to Briarcrest from Aptekissick Road. Um, but I believe that has some restrictions on it as well. Um, in our dealings with the county for uh, Sunset Grove, um, the location for the existing entrance to Sunset Grove needed to be um, essentially as far back as possible from Route 83, but also had to keep in mind there's a, there's a ridge in the road there from the sight line perspective. And uh, we work through, well, Jay, um, and, and uh, as the developer for the property and the county to come up with that alignment so that um, in the future, there's the potential for having uh, uh, another access to um, Bailey Bunyan directly across from the existing access for Sunset Grove. In, in a real generic sense, uh, this commission is charged with trying to find ways to develop the economic activity of the village at least in part to drive revenues from some source from the property. And we know it's not going to be property tax unless, you know, the earth starts turning backwards. Uh, so my question after listening to that is, should we, should we bother even talking about anything other than these very small areas that we have that are open for development? Because it sounds like logically, when I first got the call about the, the belly bunion parcel, I didn't talk much with the man who called, but talking with others, thinking about the fact that maybe there's city water coming by there in the next, say, five years. Uh, clearly, there's Lake County sewer there, which is a big plus for any kind of a developer. And it's a big space of open land along two busy commercial highways. It's not um, some bucolic subdivision like most of the villages that's tucked away in the back and says you know using that as or having it being held by ransom or hostage by single family residences seems kind of unproductive but it also sounds like after hearing jim and dave that really thinking about that would be a waste of effort is am i reading that wrong well, I, I would never say that, um, and I don't think Jim would either, that it's a, a wasted effort. The, the point that we uh, as staff always look to from the, from the very beginning is pointing the prospective developer to the comprehensive plan. 
Um, the comprehensive plan um, is laid out to um, help identify prospective uses and developments, the type of developments that would be appropriate for um, any um, uh, piece of land within the village. Um, and with the um, recent updates, maybe not so recent now, but um, at least from a few years ago, that was a very um, heavily um, uh, public involved plan that was developed. And part of those, um, uh, the, the input that, was, that helped to create that plan came from the residents that live around those properties, as you would expect. Um, so in the case of Bailey Bunyan and Omens, um, the neighboring subdivision Briarcrest was very um, uh, interested in seeing how that might unfold. Um, I would tell you that the um, comprehensive plan prior to this did not contemplate that property as being anything other than single family. And um, as Jim has, had uh, described the, the PUD for Bailey Bunyan, or the special use permit, um, that zoning is residential and it specifically states in the approval that if that use, the golf use, uh, were to go away, um, that it would revert back to um, the three acre residential. Um, that's a protection that was put in the original approvals um, and it's not something that would be atypical for a municipality to do and especially for Long Grove. Um, as it's very protective of um, its residential zoning <clears throat> and our residents. So um, the current comprehensive plan did take what I would refer to as baby steps in moving forward and trying to identify um, potential uses for that property that would be consistent with the community character and um, hopefully not upset the apple cart too much with um, with the adjoining property owners that would be um, most directly affected by it. Um, so there is some, some um, somewhat of a, a, a opening that didn't exist prior to this current comprehensive plan for that property to be something other than single family residential. Um, going from single family residential to, or from that existing use to industrial would certainly be a, what we refer to as a high hurdle. Um, and when we are talking with prospective developers, um, we try identifying what those hurt hurdles may be up front so that they know up front and they go into it knowing um, what approvals would be necessary. Um, we also do provide for um, what we refer, refer to as a pre-application meeting process. Um, that in the past has included the village president, the trustee, and um, uh, a member, the chair of the plan commission, maybe a member of the player plan commission, for them to be able to provide their input as well before um, a prospective developer makes a significant investment um, in, in capital for you know, preparing plans only to find out that it's something that would not be acceptable to the village. Um, the other thing that we do that Actually, um, although it adds a step, uh, we believe that it's to the benefit of, of the property owner and to the um, prospective developer and that if there's a, a, a code or a text amendment that's necessary, then um, that requires referral by the village board to the plan commission before the public hearing process even begins. So somewhere in between having a complete application to be able to move forward for public hearing and having a, a, a drawing on the back of a napkin um, is where we expect those plans to be in order to be able to get before the board so that they can evaluate it on a high level whether or not it would be something that they would um, even potentially consider. Um, <clears throat> the referral is is a discretionary um, process for the village board. Um, they don't have to refer it. Referral doesn't mean that that um, is to be considered as it will be ultimately approved. It, all that means is that um, there's not enough objection to it to say, let's put it through the process. 
put it through the process, see what comes out at the other end, may get approved, may get denied. But if it's a prospective use development that is so far out of whack with what the village board ever sees being approved, they're always encouraged to um, deny the use or deny the referral. Um, so it doesn't go through that ex at those extra steps only to um, spend a lot of time and money um, to come out the other end and, and not be approved. Um, an example of that would have been a few years back um, for the CF Industries property, there was a pr proposed um, multi-story apartment um, building that was um, that that came forward, and uh, because that would have required a tax amendment, it went, went before the board. The board denied the um, did not refer it to the plank. The initial reaction from the applicants were that they were upset because how couldn't they just refer us? Um, but I would tell you that the property owner, um, once we explained all of this to him, actually appreciate it because it meant that the property wasn't tied up for that, you know, to go through that zoning process could be anywhere from six months to a couple of years, depending upon how many public hearings are required, what the response is from the community, um, and, and being able to move on to whatever the next perspective um, development or use might be. To kind of tie into that, uh, just, oh, excuse me. Um, there's a couple of things with our code. If there's something's not allowed, like Dave just referred to with multifamily, we do not have a multifamily zoning district. So you would need to create an entirely new zoning district into the code. Other amendments that we typically see are called reclassifications. So let's say you were going from the R1 residential to perhaps uh, an R2 residential or an R3 residential. That would be considered what's called a map amendment. And that is separate and apart from a text amendment. Um, the processes are similar, but the text amendment, I think, is much more difficult to obtain than the MAP amendment in most instances. And with the industrial zoning that you were considering for the Valley Bunyan property, the code does not presently allow for any type of industrial zoning. There's no, no uh, zoning district for that type of use. So you would be looking at the creation of an entirely new zoning district, which can get uh, difficult and time consuming. Okay. You know what, I think the problem here is the changing environment, not just in multifamily residential being in high-end communities, but the last mile delivery for goods, and, for goods uh, requiring industrial or warehousing operations. Now, the fact is, uh, Lawn Grove could not have any of those two items and still survive, but I think that's going to be a long-term potential retrospective mistake looking back 10 or 15 years from now. Uh, just my thought. I was, I was thinking about the parcels and I was thinking about, you know, these being high traffic major streets and uh, not the kind of place where one would normally stick a single family residence. But then I thought a little bit further north to the intersection of 22 and, and 83, where there is a, a giant prairie space that the village has bought. Right. And, the, and then the two single family residence subdivisions that are on the, the northeast and the south, actually the northeast, southwest, all three other corners are all single family right up to the curb. And it's nice in the sense that it's, uh, it's unlike any other intersection like that all the way up and down Arlington Heights Road. And it does, you know, establish this is a different kind of a community. So that's positive. But um, when the guy I was talking to said, well, you know, we had this, this developer who uh, put in a book publisher and the book publisher had his central operations there. And so, it was a, a, a nondescript quiet building, but it generated tons of sales tax. You know, that was like, oh, that's, that's, you know, that's the dream for something like the, the EDC to find somebody that just without really disturbing the pond or even making a ripple could generate sales tax. But those are, I'm sure, scarce projects. And 
Mm -hmm. Another going in where was that? Well, uh, this is Dave again. Um, so the, the charge from the, uh, for the Economic Development Commission is for economic development. So that's entirely appropriate that um, people are reaching out to you and you're having those conversations. Um, that's the goal. And there's a lot of, of uh, sifting that has to occur really to, to um, find those, those um, right kind of developments that uh, might be unique, um, uh, but they, they would fit the Long Grove comprehensive plan and, uh, and our ultimately our zoning. Um, as you all know, there's there's not a whole a whole lot of potential sites in Long Grove for economic development. <clears throat> so making sure that they are um, the best possible uses for those sites is uh, is obviously uh, a very high priority in trying to maximize uh, whatever the revenues might be that come into the village. Um, the, Roger, you had made the correct comment um, earlier about property tax, um, but I would point out that it, except for when a property is located within a TIF. Um, so the Sunset Grove uh, South 15 um, are, are both located within the TIF. Um, so from a priority perspective in terms of the, the greatest financial impact during the, uh, at least in terms of the, the TIF itself, would be getting that South 15 developed because right now it's um, assessed as agricultural. It really has a, a zero property tax for all intents and purposes. And a getting a development on that property will generate um, pretty much 100% new increment for the TIF, which is important, but it should not be the driving force for um, how that property gets developed or when that gets developed. Um, you, you know that the uh, village board is considering establishing a second TIF down at Lake Cook and Route 53. Um, so that, that same thought process will apply um, if and when that TIF district gets established. Um, Dave, back to your discussion about um, Valley Bunyan and Omen. Um, so I guess you and Jim are saying there's a distinction between those properties being that Valley Bunyan has one owner and would be there for, uh, for lack of a better word, easier to get approvals for, for any kind of um, zoning changes. Valley Bunyan doesn't have residents like Briarcrest does. So I think you're referring uh -huh. to the Platt Amendment that Dave was talking about. Um, right. It still may be difficult. And the real problem with the Valley Bunyan, I think, is the conservancy easements that are on there. Um, okay. Not only do those provide for uh, aesthetics, but they've also been um, controls to a certain extent with regard to land use. The scenic corridor is actually more because uh, like with the Route 22 widening, we have scenic corridors along certain parts of Route 22. We would have to vacate those easements. Um, and what we've tried to do is keep the right of way in the current, or keep the roadway in the current right of way and not have them go beyond uh, those existing boundaries. So we do have a certain amount of control with both conservancy easements and scenic corridor easements. I think that's important uh, to maintaining the character of the village. Okay. So for properties that don't have, uh, have not been subdivided and do not already have those, you know, those type of easements recorded, um, that gives the village as much flexibility as it wants to whether or not um, to impose uh, the, the platted um, restrictions on those properties or not. Um, so, for example, Sunset Grove, um, when that came in, um, typically the village would have had, if that were developed residential, um, I believe 100-foot scenic corridor easements. Well, obviously that does not work well for a commercial development. So um, as part of the um, approval process, um, 
that went before the Conservancy and Scenic Corridor Committee and the Plan Commission, and they reduced those um, uh, the the width of the scenic corridors considerably. I want to say there might be like 20 feet or something. Is that 40? They were. Is it 40? 40. Okay. Um, but they were they were done in concert with a prospective developer um, okay. to come up with something that was reasonable um, that wouldn't have um, you know the the unintended effect of of really making it difficult for that property to be developed commercially. Okay, and that's a good point because the corridors I think were really in place to protect residential developments from uh, high traffic corridors, and we did find in Sunset is a great example. Menards is another one where that excessive setback, if you will, that corridor actually was detrimental to people finding the destination um, and uh, shopping there or, or whatever. It was just too much of a buffer uh, for commercial uses. So in both Menards and uh, Sunset Grove, uh, those were relaxed. Actually, a lot of that came from the uh, the Menards model, if you will. Anybody else have any questions, thoughts at this point? Well, now, what is you know um, what what are the zoning limitations? Let's take for example twenty two near um, Kemper. You know to to Kruger and maybe on to um, Old McHenry, in terms of something like, um, uh, you know, hotel zoning. I know it's not a permitted use in the village, correct? And what would be required in order to get that change? Well, you'd be looking at some sort of text amendment in all likelihood, probably to one of our commercial districts. Um, there's four commercial districts that we have, the B1, which is pretty much the downtown, the B2, which is a, a more general uh, commercial zoning district, but it's very limited in uh, the amount of it we have, um, the Long Grove Commons, which is up there right where you're talking about, carries with it a B2 PUD designation. So the uses and a lot of what you see there was um, part of the whole PUD approval process. The other two districts we have are the HR zoning, which is Menards, and HR1, which is Sunset Grove. So I would think for a hotel, we could probably do it as a text amendment to the B2 district. That might, that might work. Um, you would probably need services for that, which is another limiting factor to a lot of things in the community. Uh, we have a lot of uh, property that's on well and septic, um, sewer and water, probably more sewer than water. Um, but for something with, you know, multiple floors like that, typically a municipal water supply is also going to be mm -hmm. um, required. Uh, possibly in the HR1 district, um, but everything that comes in in both the HR and the HR1 districts are mandated as a PUD. And that okay. gives us control. Um, and a certain amount of flexibility until, like Dave said, it gets all approved and we kind of tighten the screws down and it's more or less locked in place. Okay, thank you. Anyone else, any thoughts, questions? Uh, what are you thinking about uh, the uh, new TIF district to the south? Are you gonna be able to get municipal water from Cook County there to come across or what's the big, what, what's the water supply going to be? Because Menards is a deep well, is that correct? Yeah, they have a, a deep well, but it's really just built for their uh, very limited water use. Um, Service use, it's not potable. Yeah, so we have um, uh, an important thing that Long Grove does have that's a, a very good tool for the community as a whole, but I think also for perspective commercial development and that we have a, a much coveted Lake Michigan water allocation. Um, as part of our allocation permit, uh, at, we, we purposely identified uh, the fact that the village of Long Grove, if it were to be served by Lake Michigan water would most likely be uh, served by multiple entities, multiple locations, just because of um, the geographic um, size and, and how much the community is, is spread out. 
So an example of that would be Heron's Landing that um, petitioned the village and, and has Lake Michigan water now. Um, they are served through Lake County, or yeah, through Lake County, who actually serves Vernon Hills. So that was their closest and most logical connection mm -hmm. point. Um, that's actually using um, uh, the village's um, allocation under our permit um, for the property down at 53 in Lake Cook. Um, that area had been identified um, as being potentially served through the Northwest Water Commission. Um, the Northwest Water Commission serves um, Buffalo Grove, Palatine, and the, the communities down to the um, southeast of Long Grove. Um, the Northwest Water Commission, as a policy, has not allowed um, themselves to sell water to, to individual communities. We were hopeful on being able to do that um, with the Northwest Water Commission when they brought their um, new line down Arlington Heights Road a few years back. Um, the members, though, um, which are the, the those communities that I mentioned, um, objected to it and said, no, um, the Northwest Water Commission cannot sell to communities, but, but members can. So in the case of that property, that would be a... Um, uh, we'd have to work out an agreement with the um, city of Palatine. Um, my understanding is that um, although Lake Michigan water is um, close in proximity, um, that there would have to be some fairly significant changes to their system in order to be able to extend it further north. Um, there's also, um, at least to be aware that there's there's some competing interests there as well. Um, you know, everyone, uh, because of the way that Illinois is set up for, um, uh, for sales tax revenue, um, communities compete for developments that are going to um, uh, provide that revenue to them. Um, so Palatine may not be um, open to the idea of, of providing Lake Michigan water if that means that we're going to get a development that they're not getting. Um, so there, there would have to be some conversations with them, um, um, you know, in, in those type of situations, there are, uh, instances where there's, um, agreements that are hammered out between the communities where there might be revenue sharing, that sort of thing in order to be able to get those services extended. Um, I don't know what the cost would be to bring, um, that water, um, north of Lake Cook Road. Uh, you know, when you put it all together, it may be another scenario um, where there's, it makes sense where there'd be a, a shared um, deep well water system um, for all the users. That's so far out, I, I couldn't tell you what makes the most sense. Um, you know, the reason that the village has the, the water system on Route 83 um, was a cooperative effort between all the property owners on Route 83 to pay for the system. Uh, they actually paid for um, about 80% of the system. The village picked up the remainder, um, and some of those properties are continuing to pay for it through special service areas. Um, but the key was that uh, rather than having um, each individual property owner having to basically drill and develop their own deep well, that there'd be a shared well, and, and the thought was that would be more economical and uh, would also help with the development, the, the future development of those properties. So I, it, it's probably too early to tell Jay on how that would be served. Um, the TIF does spell out in a very broad way um, uh, prospective budgets for various improvements. Um, there's, a, there's a large number in there for infrastructure whether that turns out to be for access improvements, public water, sanitary sewer, um, that's something that will just be uh, determined with time. But if you're talking about a multi-story hotel, uh, Lake Michigan water is gonna almost be required. Mm -hmm. I think in order, if you put the cart, cart slash horse scenario together, Lake Michigan yeah, yeah. water over at that location is, Every other corner has Lake Michigan water, doesn't it? Uh, everything is just south of Lake Cook. Yeah. 
Okay. So those are all things that um, in the coming years that the, the village will be um, working with the prospective, um, I'm sorry, with the property owners um, and prospective developers to figure out what makes the most sense depending upon what the, the uses are and what their needs are. Well, it, it certainly ought to help us assist with that process to the extent that we have this kind of information about what the underlying concerns are and what the laws are. I, I think this was a very worthwhile time to spend with both of you. Uh, oh, yeah. Unless anybody else has any key questions, uh, we could probably let you get on to your, your real day. <laughs> The, the one thing I would I would leave everyone with is that we are not here to create hurdles. Um, there are a lot of different regulations in different areas of the community, and they vary greatly. Um, so, uh, what really prompted um, our idea of, of having this conversation with the EDC was the fact that you know to try to develop a flowchart where um, you know, in, in some communities, it might be uh, a, a little easier to do that, just saying it's in this district, here's the process that you go through for this use. Um, there's so many different layers in Long Grove um, that there's oftentimes, um, you know, different aspects that um, it's, it's not as easy as say, uh, ABC, this will get you to the path, just follow these, these three steps. Um, yeah. So um, as, um, people reach out to you, developers reach out to you. Um, uh, what we would always suggest is, you know, we're always um, uh, do our best to be very welcoming and, and um, you know, professional with those folks. And if they're coming forward, please um, you know, direct them to um, the village manager or the village planner, someone on staff so that they can assist with um, uh, developing that uh, that flow chart for what approvals are necessary from the very um, from the very beginning so that everyone understands as they're um, as they're initiating their their interest in in long growth what the process is what the timing is um, you know what most developers are looking for is trying to reduce their risk and they're trying to um, have as much certainty as they can. And because we have all these different layers, um, it, it can create a, um, uh, at least a perceived, if not a real um, barrier to people coming forward because um, it, it can be complicated and it can be timely and it can have a lot of risk to go through that process. But um, I, we believe that the more that we're able to communicate that from the very beginning, um, the better off everyone will be. They know it, um, and um, uh, then they can make an informed decision on whether or not to move forward. Yeah, and to dovetail on that, we do have a process in place that Dave touched on earlier where we go through the pre-application meetings and we try to, to hammer out all these hurdles and make the developer aware. Um, they, we encourage them to talk to the residents because that can have a, a, a or surrounding property on us because that has oftentimes uh, a, a, a huge impact on the outcome of a certain uh, petition for whatever may be being considered. Um, we've had that process in place for quite a few years and actually we think it works um, pretty well. Um, we go through the pre-application meetings. Uh, when we get to the level of the plan commission and, and, and the uh, village president, uh, that's all designed to give the developer an out. If they don't get uh, a good feeling about the project, then like Dave said, they don't have to waste time and resources in chasing their tail. Um, on the other hand, if they think they've got a good shot at it, then they've got the green light to proceed. So we try to work with uh, prospective developers to get them on the best path for success. Um, but ultimately, it has to be their decision. So, well, Roger, thank you. thank you. I'm sorry, Erwin. Yeah, Roger. One question: What's what's the next step on this? Do you you got the call from this developer? Do you then refer it to Dave? 
I referred it to Bill Jacobs to say what he thought, because I, conceivably we could invite them in to talk to us and mm -hmm. maybe they'd flesh out the picture a little bit more in an informal way, kind of like what uh, Dave was talking about. But from my point of view, I think we're waiting to hear from somebody on the village board about whether they think we ought to or not. Okay, thank you. What what is the uh, what what is the exact what is the exact use pattern? Is, is it warehousing? You say industrial. Is it warehousing? Is that what you're saying? They had several ideas that they wanted to float, uh, and they were floating the ones that they knew would be the most attractive, i.e., creating sales tax. But uh, I don't think that was necessarily their idea. They they had in mind the model that Lincolnshire has done north of 22. Uh, along Milwaukee Avenue, where there were pretty large uh, office spaces or, uh, you know, breeder spaces for small manufacturers, tool and dye people. I, you know, I don't know what's all in the mix up there, but a, a lot of it is small, quiet rectangles surrounded by a lot of landscaping that doesn't seem to create a lot of noise or energy, and that was kind of what they were talking about. But I really don't know. We didn't get very far into the conversation. And, and what, is, what is the status of the Lake Michigan hookup to the, uh, well, to the uh, distribution system for downtown Long Grove? Because that, that's going to come in the floor. The meeting started. I understand it's pending. Is that? Uh, this is Dave again. So the, ap the application was submitted to the state for a $2 million grant. We have not heard anything uh, yet from the state. Um, so obviously, if, if that were to occur, then um, there's still some steps involved to um, get the agreements in place with Buffalo Grove. But we believe that we've got a, um, a good partner with, uh, with Buffalo Grove um, to move forward with that. Um, uh, I would tell you that um, uh, I'm meeting with uh, the village engineer um, and Buffalo Grove in the coming week to have some further discussions and just kind of get things in place um, in hopes that if that grant is approved, what the next steps are. Um, if the grant isn't approved, um, it'll make it a little bit more complicated because of the cost. Um, but we believe that there may be some opportunity there um, even with that cost for the infrastructure improvements, um, mm -hmm. by making by making that connection with Buffalo Grove, um, uh, that uh, we may be able to um, come up with some creative financing through the water rates to be able to um, pay for the improvements. But that's um, that would be um, the the second option, the least preferred, um, and. Um, uh, it, it's got a, it's got a ways to go, but um, the the shortest path would be if that grant is approved. Yeah, and we do. Uh, I know we we did get a cooperation agreement with Buffalo Grove. Is that correct, Dave? Yes. Yes. Yeah, they've been have, very good to work with. I think we have a good relationship with them. Yeah, that was a precondition to um, you know applying for the grant. So we do have that cooperative agreement. And obviously, Buffalo Grove is going to be aggressive uh, with their expanded TIF, too, I would suspect. I mean, some yeah, of them are I, they're, they're competitors for, for site selection between Long Grove and Buffalo Grove. Uh, I mean, their TIF is tremendous, uh, tremendous areas. Am I incorrect on that? No, you are correct. It's a, it's a very large area. Um, and that's one of the um, things that, however, future agreements are hammered out with them, uh, making sure that uh, they're not the ones that have any controls over um, uh, over that water use. So because, yeah, if they um, there there is a potential for competition there, and just as I laid out with the Palatine example, um, you know, everybody's um, looking for the kind of the rare find and. Um, uh, whatever agreements go into place with any community, you just need to make sure that um, uh, you're not um, jeopardizing the, the village's position on those things. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, well, before the, you two slip away, I suspect everybody on the call knows that Dave has taken a new position up in Monroe, Wisconsin, and we'll be leaving the village soon. And personally, I just want to say thank you for all the help you've given us uh, with the information you've shared with the EDC and uh, say congratulations and wish you well on your new situation. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. I've enjoyed working with all of you. And um, I, th I think you've got um, a very good group that is, has really gelled. And um, I wish you all the best as, as uh, uh, years come up here. I think that um, hopefully the economy is going to not hurt us all. And um, you'll, you'll have some, um, some really good economic development opportunities in the near future. Sounds good. Thank you again. All right, we've got a couple more items to go through and uh, some of them are just status reports on what's happening, but let's let's run through. Uh, the top item on the agenda is to just uh, pick up on whether anything's going on with the International Council of Shopping Centers. Uh, Pam, you have any new stuff? Yeah, um, I um, attended a meeting um, virtually and they talked about legislative priorities that um, they are following and um, they're looking to, um, in the long run, to continue to support a national grant program for uh, businesses impacted by COVID. And there, there is legislat pe legislation pending, HR 7671, the Small Business Comeback Act. And, um, so that they're they're supporting that, and um, you know, to provide for additional grants and funding for the for um, small businesses, and um, they're also targeting tax relief as one of their uh, initiatives. They support um, providing liquidity through the tax code to struggling businesses, such as extending net operating loss relief. Uh, providing a tax credit to defray the additional cost of disinfecting and safety equipment, um, updating REIT re rules to allow property owners to invest in struggling tenants, which could be something of interest for Long Grove, exempt taxation on phantom income from loan modifications, forgiveness, or cancellation. So one of the um, uh, focuses of the ICSC is, you know, in terms of legislation, is to um, lobby for additional targeted tax relief for small businesses. And um, I've signed up for an October 15th virtual seminar on the turning point or shifting um, currents in business markets. And uh, basically, they're going to have speakers that talk about the current and near-term um, asset performance, uh, rents, uh, occupancies, and an investment strategy for businesses, and um, how the election uh, and stimulus will might impact future development. So I am going to attend. It, it, it's a um, webcast featured by Marcus and Millichamp. And uh, so they're going to provide a market overview and their uh, idea of how uh, public policy, stimulus, and the elections are going to impact future development. So I'll report on that um, after the October 15th webinar. One, one other interesting thing I think they talked about in um, the seminar that I did attend was um, that there are a few trends in terms of, you know, what is uh, going to be happening for uh, retail development. And um, they did report that retailers supporting omni-channel, uh, both brick and mortar and online uh, sales, were ones that um, were growing the fastest in this economy. Um, Apple, Walmart, Target, these are, um, these are retailers that continue to support brick and mortar. So they're going to continue to, to um, uh, support their brick and mortar stores in addition to online sales. So that's um, 
that's a trend that that is continuing for retailers. And also, um, they talked about retailers that provide an experience to consumers as doing well. The examples of this are At Home, Ulta, and Five Below. So, kind of gives you an idea of um, the retailers that uh, look like they have a good um, future in this market. And uh, the other thing that they talked about too were um, kind of the, the winners and losers in this economy. And again, it's kind of a combination of um, those that have managed to um, to increase their online sales as well as brick and mortar. So it's all obviously the Walmarts of the world, the Walgreens, the Targets, and uh, Apple. So, you know, that, that just gives us an interesting um, picture of, of retail development. That's, you know, that's the kind of reaching out for information and bringing it back to us that I think is really worthwhile. As a Thank you for spending that time, Pam. That was good. Um, this popped into my mind. I was just watching last night's news this morning before the meeting. Neither Old Orchard nor Northbrook Court paid their property taxes this year. They blew off the extended deadlines and uh, simply didn't pay their property taxes. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's a way of taking a loan without getting the loan approved I mean, to many developers. But it was shocking for me to hear that big established shopping centers like that were taking a, a property tax holiday. So things are still rough out there for lots and lots of people. Uh, I know we're underway with the mailing program. Uh, Erwin, you have any uh, update status you want to share? Just, just a request. If anyone has any lawyers, bankers that they know of, whether it's uh, the EDC or the board, uh, we'd love to collect it, send it on to Denise. And uh, I'm working on a January uh, mailing also, an, an emailing, a, a letter. So maybe in the next... Uh, month, we'll have a draft of that to look at. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mike, I believe, he, yeah, Mike's gone. Uh, he emailed me last night and said he can only stay for a half hour this morning. Uh, I know he's been working on the flow chart, uh, but I'm not sure exactly where that's at. And uh, I imagine that uh, Dave has more than a few things to uh, tie up before he moves on to Wisconsin. So, We'll hear about that at the next meeting, I'm sure, in terms of where that's going, but we want to keep that going. Um, Pam, you want to share what uh, the communication you had with the, uh, the HLG DBA? Uh, yeah, we invited them to, our, um, to attend our October 27th meeting, and um, Jasmine and Jesse. And so I think one or both of them will be able to attend and uh, give us an update on some of their activities. I, yeah, I, I think it's really worthwhile to have them come in, if nothing else, than to just say, you know, we're working to see what we can do with you and make life better for you and blah, blah, blah. Right. I think, you know, we, we did in the past benefit by um, Lori Wilhelm. Will Hoyt coming to a lot of our meetings because she did share um, what the downtown was doing and their events. And I thought we got a good um, line of communication going with them. So hopefully we can, um, we, we can continue to do that. I shared some information with Jasmine. I attended the Visit Lake County annual meeting presentation on October 1st. And I was able to attend virtually, and they had some really good marketing ideas. Um, they, uh, they have articles um, every month in their Visit Lake County publication and, you know, buy books. So that's something, you know, I think we can think about or, you know, Jasmine and, and Jesse can think about for the downtown. And um, they have a monthly blog. Visit Lake County has a monthly blog which highlights different events. So Long Grove could highlight its November, coming November and December events in that publication. And um, 
They also had a marketing promotion highlighting various road trips that they published uh, in their online brochures and blogs. And they pointed out that, you know, obviously with COVID, <laughs> uh, road trips have become the thing in the area. And um, they, they set up in their materials some, um, you know, so some pro forma road trips that people could take in the area. The first one was an itinerary that started at the Lincolnshire Marriott and highlighted restaurants and sites in Lincolnshire. And I was saying to Jasmine that it looked like we could piggyback on maybe a road trip like that. Day two or day three could be um, coming down 22 to Long Grove and uh, highlight some of our shops and entertainment and restaurants in the downtown area. So um, I think they could be a good source, a visit like come, could be a, a good source of um, ideas for marketing. And uh, I think that's something that, you know, would be good for us to, um, and good for the, the downtown association to be involved with. I noticed that quite a few communities were on the board of Visit Lake County and, um, you know, like Lincolnshire and Mundelein and Vernon Hills. So that may be something that, you know, someone in Long Grove would want to um, look into as well, to have somebody from Long Grove on their board. in mind. Uh, Denise, the South Gateway website page is all set or underway or what's the status? Yes, that, that is all set and it's um, updated regularly. Like we just had the um, joint review board meeting and that was recorded. So you can see that um, on that page. And you can find the redevelopment, um, you know, the, the redevelopment plan on there because that's uh, something that will be, um, we, we have the public hearing coming up on November 10th. So um, those things are kind of put together on the site. But yes, there's, there's lots of information on there if you're interested in kind of the details of um, anything to do with the perspective TIF and um, but the the redevelopment plan is something that if um, if you really want to dive into the details that's that's where you'll find it that is really good um, how'd you do in interviews uh, I spoke with Jay I, he's he's gone now uh, he was going to talk to his people at uh, sunset but uh, it turns out my wife knows the manager over there and just told him about this. And he's, he's quite agreeable to coming in and, and talking about why Sunset chose Long Grove as a place to expand its business. So that's one possibility. And uh, Pam, you talked to the White Oaks people, right? Right, and they're, they're also interested in um, doing an interview as well. So practical steps, what do we do next? Do we want to schedule? Well, I, yeah, I was just going to ask Pam before. Before well, well, didn't we discuss at our last meeting was this going to be more of a podcast that we we post or what, what, what's before we get these people involved? What's what do we want to get? You know, what, what's our outline of how we're going to do this now going forward? Well, well I you know from my vantage point, and I don't I don't want to speak for anybody else, but I I, I did like the for, the forum we had for your interview, Erwin. I mean, I think just as a practical matter, you know, uh, you know, we can um, think about maybe starting to build more of an audience. I know that was a concern, but, you know, for us to have a, a, a venue and a forum for these, for these interviews, I think is, is the best thing. I think just to advertise, um, you know, kind of on a, <laughs> on a, uh, on a, on a, just an in, invite email basis, it didn't really seem to work out that well for our webinars. So I personally think that since we have this forum and we have dates, you know, scheduled and all, it's just an easier way. Maybe we do one a month, you know, to, um, to initiate these, um, these interviews. And we can, as we go along, we can find ways to increase the audience. I mean, we can ask 
obviously the interviewees to to bring in their own you know uh, folks you know who want who are interested in hearing their story and you know we can reach out to people that we know but I think that I, I personally think we should stick with this and we can create um, you know online um, you know access to these interviews that people can look to after you know after the fact but. I don't know. I, I think that might be an, an easier way to go, you know, being that we already have the dates and the, and the forum. Well, it make, makes sense to me. I just wanted to verify sort of what direction we're headed in because it seems like we've got the people who we can interview, at least two. Right. I mean, I don't know how frequently people think we should do it. I mean, I, what do you think? It's, it sounds like we could set up one for the next meeting and say, get the White Oaks people to come in at eight o'clock and uh, have, and I, you know, I don't know if your husband wants to get reinvolved or not. I'd love to have him again. But I, my thought is that we're not going to really, um, the focus is going to be why is your business in long robe? Why did your business succeed in long robe? The same kind of, I don't know you, let's just open you up approach that he uses would be great. Uh, delving into their, their school back, their individual background, maybe not so much this time, but what does everybody else think? Well, would, do you, would Kevin be, you know, maybe we should see if Kevin would be interested. I mean, I think there's some advantage to, you know, having some, um, uh, you know, kind of set interview format. And I thought Kevin did a very good job. You know, we can always, you know, bring in our own input into what we think should be there. Of course, we're going to be there to ask questions too. So, but I, I, I thought Kevin did a very good job if he, if he would be interested in, in doing this. I suspect Rita is multitasking. Are you there, Rita? Trustee O'Connor? I mean, we could reach out to Rita to see, and, and Kevin to see if they would, um, if he would be willing to do it. Good idea. Let's, let's do that. And then maybe the plan would be for the meeting after the next. Okay. Yeah, check with him. I don't know his schedule. Thank you. We'll do that. So we would be talking about the November meeting, then, uh, first November meeting? First November meeting, uh, okay. the people from White Oaks explaining how they ended up in Long Road. Okay. One other thought longer term to maybe get some more exposure, and this came off something Roger asked me about, is what if we went to the high school or junior college and whoever's in charge of the business curriculum, they could join for a Zoom. Maybe it's part of, you know, they're always looking for some content. It may be, hey, you know what, if you want to dial in for Zoom at uh, eight o'clock and hear about a, an entrepreneur and what, you know, what, what they did and how they did it, uh, all of a sudden maybe we can expand their audience and they could talk about it to their parents and their parents could listen to it and so forth and so on. Just, just a thought. That Noodle, noodle around. That's a, good idea. that's a good idea. I guess we can. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Maybe, um, you know, we could, we could, I don't know. What, what's your thought, Roger? I know you teach it. Uh, People who think. run lectures at COD that are, you know, they'll bring in a lecturer to talk about the current crisis in Dakar or whatever it is. Uh, they build their audiences by the simple process of saying, please, professors, tell your students they get extra credit if they come to our whatever, and then they take attendance and they send the attendance around to the teachers. And son of a gun, people show up. I've, I've done it myself. So if we can find some, some people who are teaching marketing at, C, at CLC and say, you know, would you consider blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we can do that. And a month is enough time to get that done. Yeah. Right, right. That's a good idea. I was also thinking because of White Oaks, um, reaching out to the culinary specifically, because a lot yeah. of our yeah. students and there's a big culinary program and at CLC. Oh, great. Yeah, that, 
that's a great idea. You There's know, our plan. Have, well, I, uh, it sounds it sounds like you're you've got two different objectives. One, what I just heard is one is why did you come to Long Grove? The other one is how did you become successful? So what what is what is the focus that you're looking for? I'd rather see why did you come to Long Grove as the primary focus. But I think that the other, you know, how did you become successful just generically would be unavoidable as part of. But I, I still like the idea of having something on the website that we're, where we could cut off a piece of it and go, why Long Grove? But why would, why would students and their parents be interested in that? No, they wouldn't. We'd have to pitch it a different way. You know, you'd see it's all in the pitch, right? It's all in. Well, no, I'm just. It, it, I uh, am, was a little. I'm a little confused with what is what's the focus that you're. What's your preference? I think I think the focus is to get as many eyeballs as possible to view this. You know, I, I think the talking to a person is much more persuasive than putting up a position paper or, uh, or almost anything that's written. Uh, today, people are visual learners. You hear that all the time in the education business and uh, providing some visual education, a positive thing. Um, getting it all, gathering it all and having it fresh and unscripted sounding uh, means that whether the starting point is how'd you do it or why'd you end up there uh, is still a really good way to do this and worthwhile if we can get ourselves together on this. One suggestion, um, yes. maybe, maybe you're able to uh, hit both those bullet points as part of um, kind of the, the marketing of Long Grove. And um, to me, it's, it's the success stories in Long Grove that you want to um, highlight. Um, why they came to Long Grove is certainly important. Um, why they're successful in Long Grove, to me, is probably um, more along the lines of what you're trying to do in, in terms of marketing the village. Um, as, people, as prospective businesses, um, uh, developers are looking at our website and they see these uh, positive stories of how these businesses have been successful in Long Grove, to me, is um, maybe the, the highlight that you want to point to. So we stay with the basic topic of how did you do it? How did you do it? Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. So how how did you do it can mean, uh, you know, can have that double meaning, you know, uh, why did you choose Long Grove and how did you become successful with it? You know, so it's kind of a, it kind of all ties together. You know, for example, White Oak, I don't know. I haven't really talked in depth with Tom Levin, but, you know, I'm just looking at them, you know, that they have this, um, you know, on, you know, they have this um, site, you know, uh, next to Joni's actually, and uh, they, you know, are able to produce meals and catering for maybe some of the businesses in Long Grove. So maybe that was one of the reasons they came here and maybe one of the reasons they're successful. You know, I mean, there's a number of um, country clubs, you know, um, places that could use you know, possible meal preparation, catering. I don't know. I haven't talked to him in depth about what they actually do, but, you know, let's surmise that that's part of it. Well, that's kind of a story about picking Long Grove, but then being successful. You know, why did they pick it? Well, maybe there is an opportunity there, you know, to for catering, for delivering meals to, to residents and, you know, catering establishments. And then why were they successful? Well, that's you know, that's, that's the other side of the same coin, I guess. Yeah, I'm going to volunteer myself to call Kevin and see if he would be willing to, and if he would be willing to, in the first meeting in November, 
And uh, if, if Pam, you could talk to the White Oaks people again and ask okay. them if they could reserve that morning. I, you know, I, I, we can pull together and do another one of these. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. That's Tom and Lori Levitt. Yeah. All right. And then let's let's see how that one goes. And you know, uh, the other, Denise is getting uh, good at cutting out pieces from the recording video, right? Yes, we could just do kind of an excerpt um, if we wanted to to make it just you know uh, a short yeah, version. Yeah. 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 Yep. Right. We, that's a great idea. We can have highlights, and you know, I I think like I say, you know, I think it it probably makes sense to just work with the you know, the forum that we have, because, you know, building an audience is something we can work on, but, you know, we could just, uh, as we, as we go along, we could get other ideas. But I do like the reaching out to uh, CLC, for example, is a good idea. Well, I know personally, it's disquieting to put on a video lecture and have nobody there. Uh, right. Because, we, right. you know, we, we do these Zooms with school now and often you'll open it up to the students and two people will check in and the other 20 will be who knows where. But then I look at the statistics because they gather the statistics and a lot of people do the same thing they do with videos on TV. They watch asynchronously. So I'll give the lecture and on the first day, two people will watch. But over the course of the week, 20 sign in and watch. And, and they like it better doing it when they want. So to, right, the, right, to, the, to right. speak to, you know, so nobody comes on Tuesday morning. That doesn't bother me so much as long as we've got a place, a website where we can have the core content we want people to share available. Right, right. No, and, and you know, being that it's at our meeting, you know, Roger, you know, at least we have maybe eight, eight or nine people that can ask questions. So it's right. not the kind of thing where you're just saying, you know, sending out a, a link about a webinar, and nobody shows up. I mean, that just is that that we we did that. <laughs> And it's a little right. bit self-defeating, you know, so I think we need to take advantage of what we have, you know, and build it from there. Sounds good. Um, I got a, a note from Denise the other day about, about uh, a webinar she's going to tomorrow that looks really interesting. Um, generic, Denise, you want to just say generically what it was about? Yeah, it, it is. Um, it's, I think the title is something like emerging businesses and um, like for a multi industry perspective. And essentially what it is, it's a, it's a panel of economic development and business professionals and they'll be talking about sort of the emerging retail and commercial trends that are going on and, and potential impacts to projects and um, I think it was the yeah, it was the investor requirements and things like that. So it sounded very interesting. And I think Rita might be um, attending also. So we can let you know how that goes. That's great. We look forward to hearing more about that next time. Uh, I've been, you know, this is all anecdotal and uh, social scientists will tell you it's worthless, but it seems to me like we are getting more people walking through the downtown area and that the, the the improvements that the village has put in place have made a difference. Has anybody else seen what I have, which is more people walking around during the day? You know, Roger, I can't, I can't tell you on the number of people, but I try to go through the downtown area as many times as I can as I leave the house. And I know it just looks beautiful. I mean, all the improvements and um, on the weekends, I've seen more people than usual than I've seen before. But I mean, we've got, we've got a lot to be proud of and let's figure yeah. out how we can promote it along the way. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. You know, it looks, you know, I think it, it does look beautiful. You know, it, the downtown is definitely um, uh, a good destination, you know, something that can be promoted. You know, I, as I said, I attended that Visit Lake County presentation, and they, you know, they mentioned that in 2019, um, just the visitor spend in Lake County was 1.5 billion. 
and it was up 5.6%. And, um, you know, it, it, of course, you know, this time period with COVID, everybody has taken a little bit of a step back. They said um, occupancy in hotels in the entire area is about 46%. You know, and of course, they were doing you know, more like 80, 75, 80% before COVID. So, you know, it, it's, people have taken a hit, but based on what they were saying for 2019, if the recovery is, you know, is going to look like we hope it will look, there's a lot of potential there. Sounds good. Uh, any new business? Okay. Uh, hearing none, uh, is there a motion to adjourn maybe? Actually, um, Roger, before we wrap up, so tonight um, the board is going to vote to approve oh or disprove your working agenda and your budget. And um, I'm inevitably, Bobby will ask me what, if you have any um, idea where you wanna spend that money. And I'm getting the sense that it's just kind of a placeholder holder at this point, but if you had any insights on, like, has that money been earmarked or do you have any thoughts? My thought was that the dollars that we put in were almost arbitrary. Okay. Uh, you know, we had some idea of what we might spend to promote, but so far the money we're spending on promotion is the, the cost of emailing some letters to people, not even putting stamps on them, and the cost of uh, bringing in volunteers to do these interviews and posting them up on the website. Um, I don't know how you can say it to Trustee O'Reilly, but the fact is that uh, this is not a spendthrift committee by any means, but uh, we were told we needed some kind of a budget. We tried to realistically say, what might we spend? The, the hospitality part was just figuring out what coffee would cost for two meetings a month for 20 people or so, something along those lines. So it's not, uh, we have no big plans, I'm afraid. I think, yeah, I, um, that was my sense, but I just wanted <laughs> to get your sense to make sure we were on the same page. So thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Like a motion to adjourn maybe? So moved, Roger. Thank you, is there a second? Well, there's nobody left to second. So uh, for the purpose of the record, I'll second it. Or uh, That's probably wrong. But to all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion adjourned. <laughs> Motion to adjourn passes. Thank you all for hanging around. Uh, talk to you all soon. Thank you, Roger. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Denise. Thank you.